Hello, this is Dr. Jeffrey Miller uh, talking about alveolar focused orthodontics. This is part two of a five part series. Alveolar focused orthodontics, visualization of limitations of orthodontic tooth movement through comb beam CT. I'm Jeffrey Miller. I graduated from Towson University, got my dental education at University of Maryland, my orthodontic certificate at SUNY Buffalo my board certification in 1991. I've been in private practice in the Baltimore, Air, Maryland area for over 33 years. I'm a member of the Golden Circle of Excellence and I speak on cone beam CT topics related to orthodontics. If you take a look at this force diagram, you have a weight attached to an incisor. I believe that most orthodontists would come up with the same conclusion that over time the tooth would be orthodontically extractor, extracted or avulsed from uh, the horizontal force pulling on the tooth. You wouldn't expect the tooth to move and alveolar bone continue to grow and surround the tooth as the tooth is pulled facially. But what happens if you lighten the force, if you minimize the force to a more uh, physiological force, if there is such a thing? Does that make a difference? Well, I'm afraid it doesn't. You know, you still have the same principles uh, from a histology standpoint going on, and uh, at least no one's been able to demonstrate that it makes a, makes a difference. As orthodontists, we first need to agree on where the teeth should be posi positioned within the alveolar bone. Um, who says that uh, the teeth belong at a certain angle with a certain torque? Well, I think it goes back to 1972, Dr. Andrew's famous study, Six Keys to Normal Occlusion, where he described 120 patients that were never treated orthodontically that he considered to have normal occlusion. I think there are two relevant points as they relate to cone beam CT. One is that teeth are generally centered or naturally centered within the alveolar process or the bony trough and that artificially expanded arches are not consistent with mother nature. Uh, this is Dr. Razai. Dr. Razai at the time was a general dentist. She happens to be an orthodontist now who practices in Kansas. Uh, she was treated in 2008 by an orthodontist in Florida that believed a wider, broader arch was much more attractive. So he used arch wires to express that treatment philosophy. Now is this a well-treated case? And if it's a well-treated case, by what standards are you measuring uh, the success of this result? Certainly the clinical photos look good. But if you take a look at our first molars from a coronal view, you could see that they're overexpanded. They're past the limit of the bony housing. And when you compare Dr. Rezai's to Alex's coronal view of the first molars. Alex never had orthodontic treatment. You can see that his molars are fairly well centered within the alveolar process very much the same way that Dr. Andrews back in 1972 described the ang angles that are formed from the clinical crowns of the teeth. Very consistent. When we talk about comb beam CT Combeam CT gives us the ability to visualize the cortical plates that surround and support the teeth. When you, this is the same patient, the same scan. This is a 77 millimeter focal trough versus a 0.2 millimeter focal trough. You can, with that smaller focal trough, you can get down to a single tooth and its bony support. This I'm showing uh, from a sagittal view, but you can of course look at it from a coronal and an axial view as well. If you take a look at this diagram, you here you have a patient with a class 2 division 1 and uh, here's the simulated result. Is this ex acceptable treatment in anyone's book? And uh, of course the answer is no. There's not enough bone to advance these lower incisors forward to correct for the overjet. But what if we changed it and we retracted the upper incisors to meet the lower. This is a treatment that uh, is routinely done on class 2 division 1 patients. 
either with headgear or extraction of, of upper first bicuspids, is this access, uh, acceptable treatment? And I think it depends. It depends on how much bone is there to support those incisors in the retracted position. All men are created equal. I don't believe anyone would have a problem with that statement, or I hope they wouldn't have a problem with that statement. However, uh, bone is not. Bone not only varies uh, between different individuals, it varies between the same individual and different segments of their arch. All three of these patients need retraction of the upper incisors. This patient on the far right has a lot more bone to retract those incisors you know distally than this patient on the on the left especially if you're going to intrude and retract versus extrude to close an open bite and retract this patient really wouldn't have if it was an open bite would have uh, a worse situation if we take a look at this first patient this is a, a, an adult african-american patient bimaxillary protrusive. She wants her uh, 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 anterior teeth retracted and she wants a flatter profile. This is the upper right central incisor and here's the upper left central incisor. And this is, these this come in CT, you can see their brackets on the teeth. This was taken the day the brackets were put on. At this time we took this, we were using uh, and pans and because of we were considering extracting in this case, we ended up taking uh, a cone beam CT. And what about the, ma the anchorage requirement for a patient like this? If you're going to try to retract the upper and lower incisors to flatten the, them out, uh, do you want to maintain maximum anchorage or minimal anchorage based on these alveolar processes or the, or the housing? Here's the uh, result. This is uh, photos taken about two months post active orthodontic treatment. Teeth are lined up nicely. And here is her post treatment comb beam CT. And you can see this is the upper right central incisor. It was retracted. Looks like the apex, facial apex of the root dehissed slightly. But remember the. Um, the upper left incisor had less bone to start with and here's what it looks like post-active orthodontic treatment and I don't believe that this present any kind of clinical problem because when you look at it from the axial and coronal view uh, it gives you a better picture that there's fairly good bone support there. Here's a superimposition of the upper left central incisor and pretty much what you would expect to happen happened. Now we um, made a conscious effort on this case to burn anchorage up. We weren't looking for mac maximum anchorage because the, the housing for these incisors or the alveolar process for these incisors were thin to begin with. If you take a look at the lower incisor, you can see how it was uprighted and you know I think this is what you would expect to happen. So what's the point of all this? And why does it why is it meaningful and why is it mission critical to anyone that is moving teeth orthodontically? Well, because if you move the tooth through the limit of the cortical plate, you're going to create dehiscence and fenestration. We look at uh, his, histologically, you can see we get osteoclastic activity on the compression side of the periodontal ligament. You have a force pushing the tooth this way and on the tension side you have osteoblastic activity in the periodontal ligament space. That's fine as long as the tooth moves through the bony trough or th the bony highway but once you start putting a buccal or lingual force on the, on the tooth the leading edge of that root is under compression. There's no opportunity for that ligament to go into a, a tension situation so you really only have an opportunity for osteoclastic activity and get that produces the dehiscence or fenestration. Uh, this is maybe a little better explanation. This represents the sagittal view, the coronal view, and the axial view. From the sagittal view you have the tooth starts out centered within the alveolar process 
you have the force pushing a tooth, you get uh, the leading edge of that root, the hissing through the cortical plate, but then look what happens to the bone on the lingual. It resorbs. There's an active uh, adaptive resorption of that bone, so at the end the tooth still appears to be centered within the alveolar process, but it's not. You push the root through or dehiss the root through and got adaptive resorption on the lingual. If you take a look at this this the slice was moved over so that you could see a better outline of the cortical plate. You can see here's the cortical plate and here's the leading edge of that lower incisor. It's clearly dehissed. Move the focal trough back to center it over the pulp chamber. You can see that the tooth still s appears to be centered. You don't see the extra bone that once had to be on the lingual of that tooth. The tooth was brought forward and then you got the adaptive resorption of the contralateral side. In this case, clinically, this patient had a tissue dehiscence. So we know that this is what a dehissed tooth looks like. From a coronal view, it, there's not gonna, you're not going to see, or a panoramic view, it's not going to look like any different because the height of the interceptal bone really doesn't change at all. And from an axial view, and I think this is probably the most telling, you have the roots centered within the alveolar process. You have the force that creates the dehiscence, but some of these uh, ligament uh, fibers are still under tension. There's, a, there's like a tangential fibers that cause flaring of that bone. So, you, you know, the, the cortical plate isn't just a wall that you perforate through. It does make uh, some adaptive changes, and you get this little bit of flaring and then you get the adaptive resorption on the lingual. So the tooth at the end still does appear to be centered within the alveolar process. And it's this image here that uh, some of the bracket manufacturers use to claim that their system uses a special kind of force that creates bone modification as the tooth is expanded and therefore there's no need to extract teeth anymore. It's uh, it's looking at the image and coming up with the wrong conclusion. You got a dehiscence and adaptive resorption on the lingual. And you can look at those uh, cone beam CTs that the, these manufacturers show. I know one of them took them all down from their website at some point. And you can see that the roots are clearly dehissed. And here's that same patient. You can see the lo that lower right lateral incisor. Uh, is clearly to hiss, but it's not a straight alveolar cut. It flares out. You see how it's flaring here, and then you don't see any excess bone on the lingual. Here's that same patient, 15 years post active orthodontic treatment. Uh, she came in because her lower lingual fixed retainer was broken. Uh, this is the reconstruction of the pan and ceph, and other than the supernumerary tooth up here, everything appears fairly normal. There is, uh, I don't believe there's any way you can look at the ceph and tell that tooth number 26 has dehiscence. But if you look at the clinical photos, you can see there's, you know, tissue dehiscence uh, on, on uh, all the lower anterior teeth. Now, is this a result of an orthodontic boundary violation or a, a thin gingival biotype or a combination of both? And I would suggest that the patients that have the thicker gingival biotypes are able to hide the bony defects better, and they become less of a clinical concern. What I used to do uh, before comb beam, if I saw this, unfortunately I didn't see it that often, I would put brackets on, I would shave between the teeth, and then retract the teeth back over the thickness of the alveolar process based on a cephalometric x-ray it probably wasn't a good idea because if you thin out the focal trough of that cephalometric x-ray you get an adaptive resorption of bone uh, there's really no place to to maneuver that tooth. Steve Jobs says deciding what not to do is as important as deciding what to do and I think that's a very good rule to follow in orthodontics. Uh, thanks so much for listening uh, if you have any questions or comments you can always Contact me at drmiller at orthodonticassoc.com. Thank you very much.